intellectual property is proudly brought to you by Adams and Adams, rooted in 100 years of excellence in intellectual property law. Welcome to Intellectual Property. I'm Stefan Lamprecht. This week we focus on the different forms of intellectual property. I'm joined in the studio today by Dario Tanziani from Adams & Adams Attorneys. Dario, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Stefan. Dario, I think last week we started off just talking briefly about what is intellectual property, but can you just give us a, an, an overview from your side about the role and value of intellectual property? Well, Stefan, in a sentence, intellectual property is what it implies. It is the fruits of the human intellect okay. in various areas of endeavor. And if you want to summarize it succinctly, really, it, it leads to innovation and progress. Innovation and progress. Okay. And I think that's a, that's a very good point that you're making in the sense that what, what we want to achieve as a country is very much focus on, on innovation. I think innovation comes around quite a lot currently if we think about government policy. Well, I, th I think we, we spoke about the definition and, and a little bit about the uses of intellectual property, but surely there are different types of intellectual property. Can you give us some examples? Stephen, yes, there's a wide panoply of rights which, uh, which cover intellectual property. Okay. Patents, trademarks, okay. copyright, registered designs, plant breeders' rights, domain names, and there are also the so-called unregistered rights or common law rights such as know-how and also common law trademarks. Now, from a, from a business point of view, how do I distinguish between, between these different types of intellectual property rights? When do they apply? When do I pursue certain uh, protection, certain forms? Well, patents are mainly directed at technical innovation. Okay. Anything that's new and inventive and is capable of being applied in trade or industry or agriculture okay. is more than likely susceptible to patent protection. Yeah. Uh, trademarks is uh, more deals with branding. Okay. Um, so the the well-known brands, the Coca-Colas and, okay. and all that of, of this world. Registered designs deal with the appearance of articles, but not only in relation to their aesthetic appearance, also insofar as that appearance may be relevant to the function of a particular article. So, for example, a, a component in a car engine uh, that needs to work in a certain way in order for it to, to be functional. Precisely. Um, okay. And also, it would cover things like mask works, integrated circuit topographies, and, and things okay. like that. Copyright is mostly directed at artistic works, musical works, literary works, um, so-called uh, artistic copyright. But there is also a technical element to copyright, such as technical drawings, mm -hmm. which are very important for small and medium enterprises. And, uh, and if you think about uh, you know, all the discussions that's currently going on around open source software and so forth, that is pretty much a, a copyright issue. That is pretty much a copyright okay. issue, yes, as software is one of the species of, of uh, intellectual property which is covered by copyright. Okay and in some cases also by patents. Uh, can we stand a, uh, still a little bit on, on patents, for example? If, if, I, if I have the option, I've come up with a new idea, um, is the patent route the only route? Or are there other routes that I take to protect my invention, to protect my uh, innovative idea? It can, uh, your innovative idea can be protected by a number of these rights that we've discussed. It could very well be protected by patent. At the same time, it could have elements which could be protected by registered design. Mm. For example, elements of appearance. Uh, there could be elements which are protectable through copyright. Okay. And at the end of the day, you might want a good brand in order to promote your product. So it's a so whole package. It's a whole package okay. that can apply, okay. not just one. Now, now thinking, I mean, a, a lot of times when we have these kind of discussions, there's a lot of focus on the protection of intellectual property. But can you elaborate a little bit about that form or, or type of intellectual property as a vehicle in my business commercialization process? Yes, Stefan, frequently uh, small and medium enterprises don't have the resources to go into a particular market, but they have invented something particularly good. Yeah. And then there's, a, there's the license, there's always the licensing option, um, in terms of which they remain in ownership of the patent, yeah. but they grant permission to other people to exploit it and then in return for a royalty to themselves, which in many cases would be the, the, more, um, okay. the more appropriate route to follow. So if you, if you think about it differently, saying that if I want to license something, then it does make a lot of sense to define what I'm licensing. The better it's defined, the better it's going to be sustainable in the long run. Certainly. Yeah. If, yeah. You, if you're licensing a patent, then by definition, the patent itself will set out what it is that, that you are licensing. Okay. But in many cases with know-how, you have to be very careful how you define the know-how that you are licensing out. Okay. Uh, now, in the academic and research environment, there's a lot of talk about this issue of 
disclosing versus publication. Um, or, or publication probably as a form of disclosure, but should I disclose or should I first try and patent and, and get protection for my idea? Can you just give us a little bit of thought from your point of view uh, as to the process? Um, what happens if I've disclosed my idea? Can I go and patent it afterwards? Just elaborate on that. Stefan, as a general rule, you shouldn't make any disclosure at all until you've actually filed a patent application okay. in respect of, of the invention. In some cases, especially in the case of small and medium enterprise, which uh, may need assistance in developing the invention mm. to fruition, you can make a disclosure under cover of a confidentiality and development agreement okay. to a particular instance who might help you then to, to finalize the invention, as it were. But the general rule is do not disclose until such time as you've filed a patent application or a registered design application in respect to the invention. So you so say, if I want to, I mean, I'm an, an entrepreneur, I'm excited, I've got a wonderful idea, I want to go tell people about it, um, I should first speak to, to somebody that can help me to formulate what it is and try and get that patent application into, uh, into filing process. Yes. First speak to your patent attorney before you speak to your friends about okay. it even. Um, I think, can we, can we uh, talk a little bit about the issue of a patent versus a trade secret? In, in which instances will I just keep it secret and not reveal that, that new invention to anyone? Well, in an instance where, for example, you wouldn't want the actual invention itself to become known to the public because the trade-off of the patent is that you get 20 years of exclusivity, but in return for that you have to disclose in your patent specification exactly what it is that your invention is. Yeah. At the end of the 20 years, that all goes into the public domain. Yeah. Now, if you don't want that to happen and you have a particular formulation, for example, which you believe that you can keep secret for much longer than 20 years and still derive the commercial benefit, then you don't go the patenting route. You keep yeah. it completely secret and you go ahead and you exploit it without patenting. But, but obviously then there's a lot of uh, responsibility from my side to keep it a secret. And, and especially if you work with engineers and scientists, as we mentioned, where you want to tell people what you've come up with, that can be a very difficult process. It can be, uh, and it has to be very carefully and uh, circumscribed and described in the various documents for whomever the engineer may be working. Yeah. Uh, contractually bound to keep things secret because the product's going to be out in the marketplace and the, the, the presupposition is that nobody can really analyze what it is that it's made up of. So you've got to go to court and, and then it's got to be revealed in public what that trade secret actually was or wasn't and, and so forth. And it's If you do end up going to court, hopefully yeah. you don't. Yeah. Uh, the only way that you would really want to go this route is if, you, if it's possible to commercialize a product without somebody finding out what it is that is in the product. Yeah. Um, I think the tip one good example would be Coca-Cola. They never patented their formulation. Yeah. They kept it secret all these years and they carried on um, okay. exploiting it to great advantage that way. That's one route. Okay. But uh, in, other, in other cases, it's inevitable that the composition or the particular machine that you are, that you are going to exploit mm. will become known to the public. There's no way that you can hide what it is that's in there. Yeah. In that case, you, you might as well patent it because then you'll get your 20-year exclusivity okay. in any case. Thank you very much, Dario. Thank you for, for joining us in the studio today. Join us again next week when we dig deeper into how to derive value from intellectual property and how to exploit intellectual property for strategic and competitive advantage. Until then, from me, Stefan Lamprecht, and team, it's goodbye. Intellectual Property was proudly brought to you by Adams and & Adams, rooted in 100 years of excellence in intellectual property law. Thank you.